All right. So, well, why don't we, why don't we get started? I'm going to mute you just so we don't have any um, background noise. So if you do want to speak, feel free to unmute yourself at any moment. Um, but so yeah, it's um, it's exciting to be here today. I hope we have a, a few more participants that come in a little bit. Um, but anyway, if, if they if, even if they don't, I think we're going to have some really interesting discussions. The three of us. Um, so it's really uh, it's it's really obviously such a shame that we're doing this online because I think we would have had a lot of more kind of interest if we were in Utrecht. Um, because this in particular, this panel has been something I've been wanting to do for a little while. Uh, Jordan Biet, who I organized this with, um, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, we had planned to do this last year, and then when it went online, it didn't go through. And then this year, I was just, I was convinced that we needed to do something, um, even though it may end up online. So here we are, and I'm really thankful to both um, Nadira and um, Eleonore for, for agreeing to come, um, despite these um, circumstances. And uh, the, the, the panel in itself doesn't really need much more of an introduction than the title, Indian Perspectives in the History of Economics. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring, or Jordan and I are trying to put together a group of scholars that work on this question of kind of India, the country, um, the subcontinent um, in the history of economics. But and, and as I'm sure um, you've seen, and as we shall see, we're doing very different things, but we have this common um, theme um, of India. And um, so I'm uh, listed here to go first. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and, and get into my presentation. Uh, Now, my only question to you is that you now, do you see this weird screen where you have all the different slides and notes and stuff? Yeah, I don't like it when you do, when you see that. So I'm not sure how to completely change it. So I'm gonna do, bear with me a second. I'm gonna do it like this, if you don't mind. Is that, is that all right? Is it clear enough? Wonderful, thank you, um, Nidia. Um, all right, so I'm going to be um, presenting a, um, a paper in a larger project that I've just started. So this is very preliminary kind of ideas and questions and some kind of first results that I've had with one of my co-authors. It's the new project basically trying to bring the peripheral countries into the history of national accounting um, because we tend to Kind of concentrate on the US in particular, but also just the Western countries on, um, and we tend to say that they were, you know, the, the pioneers of this national accounting, when in fact, of course, this has been happening all over the world for, for quite some time. Um, and I have two um, co-authors for the moment, one being here, the Wilhelm Aminoff, you've seen, this is the person with which I'm writing this particular paper um, with, who one, was one of my students at the American University of Paris. Um, and then I'm also writing with um, Cecilia um, uh, Leonas um, Banata. I'm, I'm saying her name completely wrong here, so apologies. Um, and we have yet to, to, to write a paper together, but she's also part of this project, bringing the Argentinian perspective in, um, because this paper today, which I'll be presenting, is on India and Nigeria. Um, and hopefully that will become clearer kind of as we go along as to why I've, um, you know, chosen these particular studies. Um, all right, so the idea is, so why am I, why are we doing this kind of the beginning? And then I'll just give you a little bit of a hint about the end or our preliminary results for now. So today, I think everyone will kind of agree that GDP is often assumed as this universal um, figure that tells us you know, how large an economy is or how well it's doing if we look at the growth or how poorly it's doing. Um, when in fact, of course, it's conceived in a particular space and time. And, you know, you, you know, for example, we talk about the GDP kind of being standardized in the 1930s in the US and you can see Dan Hirschman's thesis from 2016, which was excellent um, doing an historicization of this, of, this, of this thing, right? Of this figure, the GDP. And so 
if we if we if we agree that of course the GDP or national accounting as a whole is is produced in these particular kind of chronotypes in these contiguous spaces and times, then well, why don't we not look at what national accounting has looked like and how it's been done in the periphery? And that's if you really look at the history of of national accounting, that's not really been done very much. Um, I mean, of course, there are examples, and I would love to hear more um, examples than the ones I have, because I'm sure I haven't found them all. Um, but what's interesting then is that, so, so you know, starting this project out, I'm thinking, okay, because GDP, national accounting, so national accounting as a whole is, is, is probably quite specific to the context, well, then the periphery being different, having historical differences with the, um, the core um, would have different different national accounts, right? different ways of counting, different ways of doing things. But in fact, what we've found is that, sure, to some extent they do, but to, to a large extent, it's the same, right? They're having the same discussions around what is national accounting? How do we count our economy? Where are the boundaries of our economy? And so actually, in actual fact, that periphery is, having, is, is taking part in the global debate and about how we should count our economies. Um, and so, what I'm then the end kind of here too is that I want to bring um, the periphery into these discussions around national accounting um, be because they can actually um, add to the, to the debate as a whole and uh, right okay so um, what who is then our what am I talking about when I say the periphery right I'm talking about countries outside of Europe and 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 Northern America and um for now, at least in this paper, we're only talking really about the colonized periphery. We're talking about India in the late um, 1800s, and we're talking about Nigeria when it's just become independent in the 1960s. Um, but so it's it's the two countries that that were either in the period colonized or had been colonized, right? So I'm looking here in this paper at the colonized periphery. And colonizers, of course, we, we see this in some of the history of national accounting that colonizers started to count colonies in order to calculate um, profitability. Um, so, you know, can this colony be profitable for us, right? You know, we have to pay some of the salaries of the administrators or the, the tax collectors in India, for example, and can we get the, you know, the revenue back? Um, and, and the idea was that colonies had to be at least self-sufficient, if not profitable, right? And so they then had to account their economies in order for, to, to, yeah, whether they were they were profitable but of course once they start counting as well that means that the the the, the natives of the colonies also become governable right they become this population that is visible and they start to understand them and they can just like the way tax systems works the world over you know you need to be you need to exist on paper right you need to exist in the bureaucracy in order to be taxed right um, and so, so this national accounting made the colonial population governable. And there's a few studies that have shown um, have showed this, right? This, and 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 the main idea really is that accounting, national accounting, yes, but accounting as a larger thing, right? Like, for example, census, etc. There are other forms of accounting than national accounting, of course, um, is essentially an imperial tool. Right, and and that's a really interest. That's a really important thing to understand in this in this context. In fact, right, because then if national accounting is an imperial tool, well, why do the natives of the countries then feel the need to national account? Because, and that brings me on to my um, case studies, is that we're looking at our we're we're, we're very adamant that the people that we're going to be looking at the, the 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 economists that we're counting are from the countries that we're looking at, and I'm not. Um, so, so they were born in that country or they had large, you know, they spent large um, portions of their life in this country, right? So, because in the example of Nigeria, um, there were national accounts before the one that we're going to be looking at, but by Europeans, right? So by colonizers and so on. So, so the idea is that really trying to look at, um, at examples of, I guess you could say a native a national account, or I mean, it's a bit hard to find a word for this, but I hope I'm being clear enough as to why these these that that's kind of the first thing in our case studies that are that's important and they're also quite understudied the first so the first case study we have is in india in the in the in 1870 
Dabada Naruji publishes the first ever Indian national account um, in order to prove um, poverty in India. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a, in, in a minute. It's the beginning of the nationalist um, in the nationalist movement. And so, yeah, the question around, so why would this uh, economist pick up this idea of counting the economy when this was an imperial tool to govern um, this native population, or this, this foreign population? Well, he, he's really trying to use, um, he, he says, you know, that you can use facts as armor, right? Because facts are these detached, things from reality, right? They're objective, they're true, right? And if you can prove that there's poverty with a, with a figure, um, with a very low national income, then um, you know, the nationalist movement can take root and, and, and start to gain traction, et cetera. Um, and then the second case study we have is the first independent um, national account in Nigeria by this economist called Pios Okigbu, um, who's, um, a, a real star in Nigeria at the time, you know, he did his, um, he, he had a great education and, and was definitely um, part of the elite, much like Dabadan Naruji. And he wants to recount the, the national um, economy, uh, critiquing quite widely a, 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 um, a preceding national account done by two people called Preston Stewart, Europeans, British in particular, um, that had that had come up with a, a national account figure for the 1950s. And so he took the same years in the 1950s and, and, um, and, and came up with a different figure. Um, all right, I'm just looking at the time, if we're okay, yeah. All right, so the first, just quickly then, the first Indian national account, as I said, um, Naruji wanted to prove poverty. So he said, okay, if I can come up with a national income esti estimate, which was to him was 20 euros per capita, uh, 20 euros 20 rupees per capita um, and then came up with a cost of living estimate um, he could compare those two and if one you know if the cost of living was higher then the uh, national income India was poor and that's what he found and then that 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 figure was widely criticized afterwards um, by the colonial the imperial administration um, and we'll get, uh, hopefully I'll have time to get into some discussions about what the criticism was. And then Kigbu, as I said, he, he criticized uh, a national account that had come before. So it's interesting that Naruji is the first and then being answered, and then he answers back to that criticism. And Kigbu is the opposite, right? He's answering another, another national account coming from the colonizers, right? So it, I like that interesting that the, they're not in the same context. So does that lead to different um, conclusions or different discussions, right, is the idea. Um, and of course, the context here, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to get into it very much, but the context is obviously very different in the 1870s and the 1960s, right? In the 1960s, GDP, you know, the standardization of national accounting had taken place um, around the 1940s. And so, of course, um, Okibu is also talking to that standardization, right? The, I mean, the debate is much more rigorously global at that point. Um, so then, the the, the um, apart from kind of a, a very extensive contextualization of these different periods and the history of national accounting in our paper, what we try to do is understand what the you know what Naruji and Akibu think about what should be counted and how, and they really have quite intensive conversations with their you know um, Naruji with the colonial administration, the counters there of national accounting. And Okigbu with the president, president um, the preceding economist who had come to Nigeria from Europe to count the Nigerian economy, and um, they have yeah quite intense conversations around you know what what should be counted, what shouldn't. And Naruji, for example, is very Marxist in his way of counting the economy. He says that only material production should be counted, for example, not railways because that just distributes goods. And of course, anyone who knows the Indian perspective. Well, understand that that also has to do with the fact that railways were British and the profits were sent back to Britain and so on. So there's there's lots of um and sort of contextual issues to understand here too. I'm not going to have time to um, go through all of that, but we, maybe in the discussions we can we'll talk more about it. Um, Okigbu's um critique, which the one that I find the most interesting, is that he says, look, 
the Preston Stewart that preceding the, the, the national account that came before in Nigeria had estimated statistics for the intra-household activities. So essentially the inform what we could call the informal sector. And Okibu just said, look, okay, all right, we have a huge informal sector, but so does Europe, right? And we the data is so scarce that it is unreliable to use, so we should not use it. So that is, I find that quite phenomenal that he's saying, look, okay, I know we're different, but we might not be as different as you think we are. And if the data is so bad, then why have it? You know, what's what's the point? The other one, where the space where he he says that, you know, the triple entry accounting that's done um, in order to, you know, get these three figures and they, for them all to equal, he said, that's just impossible in Nigeria. We don't have all the data. And yet the other, the other two economists um, did a double entry, not a triple one, but a double one, um, kind of using statistics that if he would just as well, they're, they're so far from the, I guess you could say the truth that, that it's just, it's useless, right? Um, so quite interesting discussion. The, 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 find, the other thing too in Okibu's national accounts, it, he includes peasant investment. So I guess you could talk about that as being uh, maybe more, yeah, also difficult to get data, but he said that was really, really vital because the agricultural sector was so large, something that Naruji does a lot too. He, he spends a lot of time counting the agricultural sector in India, which he feels that the imperial administration don't do thoroughly enough because both of them understand that their economies are predominantly agricultural. So that's really the sector that needs to, needs to be counted and, and, and well. All right, I'm gonna to go to my last slide now. Um, and so, yeah, the end for now, obviously this is very preliminary um, uh, ideas. Um, what kind of what I think, what I think we're trying to do is we're trying to say, look, national accounting happens on the local level, but at the same time, it happens at, on the international level. And I mean, you know, I talked about the periphery being colonized here, right? Of course, then it has to happen on the international level because, you know, India is directly connected to Britain at the time of Naruji's national account. Nigeria has just become independent of, of, um, of Britain in, 19, in the 1960s, right? So they're clearly connected to another country far away from theirs right um so there is this local level and international level just in terms of politics and realities but it's also um in terms of the national accounting the discussions that they're that they're having right Naruji saying look uh we should only count material production well as i said that's actually quite a marxist view of of how things should be how an economy should be counted so he's taking part in this global debate about how we should see our economies um, and Okibu too, you know, saying, look, an informal sector is, is good if we had the statistics to count it, but everyone has an informal sector. And it's in, it, the fact that by the, the very definition of informal means we don't have statistics on it, right? So, um, so the idea is that there's this, um, um, yeah, this is both local and international level. And I think this is a real key on finding because we often overemphasize, I think, the specificity of the periphery um, and how different it is from the core when in actual fact the periphery often share things with the core right including how they count their economies right and there are lots of reasons for this right the idea here is now is that we need to start thinking about well why is this right well there could be lots of different reasons of course accountability and um, comparison right you want to count the same way as other countries so you can compare how big your economy is to another and there's also some path dependency, right? How, how were things done in the past? And, um, um, and you kind of follow on to those standards. Um, and especially for Akibu doing it in the 1960s after the standardization of GDP, um, the GDP figure, he had a lot of path dependency there. But there's also economic knowledge, right? Just the fact that, you know, what do we think is wealth, right? And so, for example, Naruji, it's material production and India was an agricultural country. So it was the, production of um, yeah, agricultural output. And interestingly enough, he said agricultural output for human use. So not fodder for animals, for example, because then you would be double counting. Um, yeah, I'm gonna stop there. Um, thank you for listening. We have um, a few minutes for um, questions.
Okay. Um, Elena, do you want to begin? Uh, for what, for questions? questions? Yeah, 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 sure. And thank you so much, uh, Maria. It was really, really fascinating. Uh, I just had a, a question on the local, what, what you call local accounts uh, and the periphery, because there is a periphery well, between the, the metropole, the core, the London, for example, and, and India and Calcutta also. But I, I, there's also the question of the district accounts. So what, what is local for the colonial administrators as well? Because they also have these ideas of what is in the periphery, what, what is the colonial periphery for also the colonial bureaucracy. So in between the national, the international and the local, the question of yeah, the, the district accounts maybe of, uh, of uh, colonial actors. Uh, and do they have also different practices of accounting uh, from what you find in the uh, office in Calcutta or, office of, or the India office in London, right? So maybe it's just an open question. Uh, listening to you with the local periphery and stuff, I was uh, thinking of that. Uh, so maybe just mm. this first question. I, I'm saying, you know, the periphery, like the rural in India, in a sense. Like the periphery in India, the core yeah, versus yeah, the also maybe the periphery also for the the colonial mind in between well those who are in place in the districts and those who are in place in Calcutta in the capital or those who are in place in London do they have different practices of accounting behind the you know the, the common colonial uh, colonial mind so. Yeah, but maybe so that's is, what you're trying to, to study. Or... Yeah, this level of, of detail in the Indian national accounting is not what I'm doing, trying to do here. But I mean, at the, it's a very interesting question. But that, the, the, what I'm, I'm looking at Naruji's national account and then his, his exchanges with the colonial administration and their, their um, national account figure that comes as a result of his, right? Because um, they, they want to prove that the national income is actually higher than what Naruji says, right? Because that makes them look better, right? And they do find a higher figure, um, ma mainly because they add um, railway profits and um, export profits, which Naruji says, well, but we don't get that, you know, it's sent oh. back to Britain anyway. So it's not our national income. It's not the Indian national income. But anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that at this economist who's an elite. Um, he's in um, uh, Bombay um, and, and so yeah, urban center, but he goes out, to, like he collects a lot of data from the districts and he's very, I mean, I didn't have time to go through that in my presentation, but he, was, he, he works out the output for unirrigated land versus irrigated land. And then he guesses how much um, yeah, he guesstimates how much irrigated land there is in each district and how there's much unirrigated, and then he does, you know, calculations based on based on that, right? Um, I mean, they're huge guesstimates, just like the Imperial Administration's National Accounting, because it's just they just don't have enough data. But he, so there, he's getting the data from the Imperial Administration's counting, right? So he's going to these local offices and getting the. Um, the, the the statistics that the imperial administration have collected right so he's not collecting but he does have contact in the cotton industry in particular where he um actually gets first-hand accounts from a you know an indian businessman right who runs a cotton a cotton mill i think yeah um which is interesting one of the questions that we ask is it because they're natives do they have access to more data and i feel at the, or do they search for more data maybe you know and i think in that case naruji actually that's a good example to, to to say yeah that that's true you know he go he goes out of his way to find more data than the imperial administration um now to the so but i guess you know the the um, your question around you know what do they think of the periphery i don't do they, do they, you know, would an imperial administrator question the fact that India is part of the periphery? I don't know. Um, and, but on the other hand, Naruji, I think he, 
doesn't want India to be part of the periphery, right? He's trying to say, no, this is actually an active economy that deserves to be counted. Um, and yes, it's poor now, but it's poor because of Br the British and we need them out in order to, 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 to increase this number, right? To increase this national income. And just, I guess, with the comparison with the, uh, maybe there is a use of the Indian princely states as well. There is, there is a difference for now between the, what is counted in the, in the, what is formally controlled by, by the British and what happens in the princely states where maybe they have more autonomy with their, their own accounts or, or maybe not. But, yeah, it's really interesting. I need to go back to his source where he, like, because he, he counts, where he gets statistics from the princely states as well. Um, but he doesn't comment too much on it. Um, yeah, really good question. Let me look into it. <laughs> May I? Then yes. just, um, yeah, thank you, Maria, that, I mean, there are so many, I have many questions that are, hopefully we can, you know, continue outside of the conference as well. But maybe if I focus on one, and that is uh, about Nauroji's um, insistence on counting only the material uh, goods or material production in the in the national accounting. I'm I'm just interested in that stance because, like I mean, you said it could be a reaction to the colonial enterprise. There is a reason for that, and I understand why. Maybe uh, leaving out the railways is because railways belong to Britain and it it inflates their accounts and not the local accounts. If I'm using the correct word now, but I'm also um, but at the same time. Um, it's interesting because, well, now Roji's, you said his idea was to prove poverty. And um, so proving poverty. So my question is, he's proving to whom in the sense that I, I know um, he was, he came up with the definitions. He wanted to show that India was actually maybe poorer because of the colonial um, enterprise. And hence, just I'm just wondering whether we've lost you. Have we? Um, yeah, what happened? Ooh. Yes, or... I don't know. We are no, still connected. We are connected. See, on Oh. Is it Wi-Fi or is it it's open? See, Asheris is there. Yeah, she has, she has disappeared, so maybe she has a problem with that. Yeah, Basque. This, I just noticed that she was yeah. not moving, but. Uh, maybe she's, she's trying, trying to reconnect. Yeah. Ah. I'm impressed. Huh? I'm impressed by this. I know, I know. <laughs> no, and actually, it's almost more distracting because we've yeah. got here and here. So I don't know where I'm supposed to look or speak. <laughs> but I think they see us here. So yeah. this is eye level for them. Okay. Whereas if we look up where... Yeah. Ah, there she is. Okay. So you're back. Hey. Yes, hello. <laughs> hello. Um, my internet cut out. That's all right. I was just wondering. Okay, fine. I don't know um, what exactly which part of the question I need you, to read. So I, yeah, I, I, I really only got the very beginning. You were talking okay. about how, uh, what's the, well, you know, what's the reasoning for neurology only um, counting yeah. material production? And, and then the, the reason I'm asking this question is because you were you explained that Naroji's um, point was to prove poverty. And that I think that's fascinating because um, just this whole thing in the in the question of calculating poverty levels and what the threshold is, uh, I'm just interested in knowing whether he focused on, again, a very material calculation of poverty. And the reason I'm asking this question is because today we've moved to definitions 
and calculations of poverty lines which uh, are not merely material i'm thinking of well you know my uh, classic reference is amatya sen and his reference is well poverty is deprivation so it's not just a lack of income or money so i'm i'm it, it's just interesting how naroji's position with regard to accounting and material calculation and then does that also is that how he conceived of poverty at the time and does that reflect maybe a position with regard to the british you know position in india so yeah go ahead yeah no it's it's um yeah the, the i mean the material i think yeah what is poverty it's it's the question that came up quite a lot in my in my thesis you know like what how do they define this idea of poverty because they're not they don't specifically write you know my definition of poverty is this right no. so you have to find it through their the, the you know how they do the national account yes. or how they answer certain questions and so on and so because he says look i want to prove poverty here i am trying to work out national income and then i try to work out cost of living which are really shelter um, clothes and food. And he uses, in fact, um, his cost of living index is based on a, um, inmates, the cost of inmates in a prison oh. in India. Because, I mean, that's really because it's the only data he could find. Yes. But it, it's, you know, they are, they have bare necessities, right? They have shelter, clothes and food, right? And then he takes that figure and he takes three quarter, like he times it by the he times it by the population and then he does it takes only three quarters of that because he says look these are adults in the prison and we have lots of children you know we have this percentage of children in india um i mean it's a, it's a, it's a guesstimation you know clearly a guesstimation right a big guesstimation but yeah i think his definition of poverty is very much material um and um so so there's there's so there's two things really there's one yes that he doesn't want to count railways for example because it's british but he also doesn't want to count railways because they're services. They're, they're things that move goods from A to B. And so that's not wealth. That's not okay. wealth. So yeah, it's, 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 a very, it's a very narrow definition of wealth, I think. Yeah. Yes. Which then has to do with his definition of poverty, right? Yeah. Correct. And, and I mean, would you, in your findings, would you say that that is um, because of maybe the the this need to keep you know the local accounting separate or to show that well india is poor because of the colonial enterprise because i'm again that idea of proving poverty proving to the british is it or to just everyone what exactly do you uh, mean that's a good question proving? yeah yeah i think it's as the it's first and foremost to the British, right? Because it's the beginning of the nationalist movement. He's really the first one to really mm. publish, you know, in economics, on in the field of economics here um, in the 1870, specifically with this national account. It's the first thing he publishes. Mm. It's called The Wants in India um, and published in 1870. And then it's, you know, he, he works on it um, a little bit. He, 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 yeah, he corrects a few things and then publishes again in 1871, which is the, the what we know now, um, what we read now. Um, that that's the okay. account we read now, but and that's you know accessible in the archives and so on. Uh, yeah, so I think the, he's trying to prove yeah poverty to the British to say, look, you're not doing a good job because you're supposed to be you know um, producing, you're supposed to be civilizing us and so on. But the narrow definition, I think it's an interesting question as to like why, why? But I think it's very much based on his economics, right? Yes. Um, as you said, yeah. the easy, it's easy to easier to calculate, right? Also. Yeah, it's easier to calculate. It's also these, this idea of facts, right? It's objective. Mm, yeah. Correct. Um, I, I, I have to, I'm looking at the time and I really don't yeah. want to take more time of, from, the, from your presentation. So I'm going to... Well, let's unfortunately stop here, especially for me, unfortunately, because this is really interesting. Um, but hopefully we can continue this at some other point. Um, all right. So now we have Eleonore Chantal Bernard. You, um, are you going to 
you're going to be able to move the laptop a little bit closer to the computer, yeah. And so, Eleanor, you're going to be presenting the economic concept of scarcity in the British Indian imperial, imperial context in the 1860s to 1910. Just give me one minute to open the slide for her, and then Thank we're all set. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah, you have, you have um, 20 minutes. I, I Should I let you know when you have five minutes left? Switch this off because it's going to take up too many. Yeah. All right, I'm going to uh, let Eleanor. Take the share. Yep. share with so this one. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Nadira. <laughs> so is it okay? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah, Lana. Um, um, okay. So I'm focusing today on the economic concept of scarcity in the British Indian imperial context in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, so economics, as Joseph Stiglitz uh, once said, is the study of scarcity, how resources are allocated among competing uses. Uh, as this quotation shows, scarcity has been central to economical thought and to economical practice by governing allocation processes. Moreover, the current ecological crisis and the connected issue of sustainability has triggered a new interest uh, on the politics of scarcity and on the links between economics and environmental change. We can refer, for example, uh, to the recent books, okay. To the recent books by Edward Barbier, Scarcity and Frontiers, How Economics Have Developed Through Natural Resource Exploitation in 2011, or to the more recent book by uh, uh, Johnson Brewer, Former and Trentman, called Scarcity in the Modern World, History, Politics, Society and Sustainability, 1800. 2075. So this latter book explores the accelerating stress on resources from the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution uh, by focusing on the changing approach to scarcity according to time, according to space, and according to population. And colonial contexts are key examples, I think, of the politics and economics of scarcity in the 19th century. Actually, scarcity is central to administrative rule in colonial India, which is founded, uh, as you as you shown, uh, on the principle of government on the cheap. So administrative and financial resources are considered as scarce and are to be allocated profitably for the metropolitan core and the imperial system. Financial austerity is the leading budgetary principle since the reforms of the 1860s by James Wilson in the Indian Treasury, and the colonial state concentrates on collecting the land tax, on securing profitable exports of cash crops, and on maintaining a standing army for the defense of the Raj. Indirect rules gives latitude sometimes to vernacular structures for both political and economical reasons, and poor relief uh, is delegated mostly to private charity of Indian elites uh, or European missionaries. But ever since the beginning of territorial control by the East India Company in the 18th century, devastating famines uh, periodically strike colonial India. And during these times of crisis, the scarcity of primary resources 
uh, and the scarcity of administration mixed together, challenging the principle of cheap government. In the 19th century, famine policy mainly rests on economical laissez-faire. But scarcity also commands forms of intervention to maintain colonial rule and to secure the stabilization of the market. But how do colonial actors actually make sense of scarcity during famine? What resources are considered scarce? And how does this impact the public response to famine? Finally, does famine administration produce alternative ways of conceptualizing scarcity and of politicize, politicizing sorry, uh, allocation problems? So uh, what I propose to successively address these three basic questions by focusing on the example of the 1866 Orissa famine uh, as a major crisis in the colonial cheap government of scarcity. So basically the historiography on famine in India has traced the impact of uh, the classical political economy on the colonial administration as shown for example by uh, Ambirayan's work so according to Adam Smith analysis, public intervention in C is seen as a cause of the degradation from scarcity into famine. Classical political economy locates scarcity in nature. Famine is the result mostly of scarcity of rainfall leading to drought and to bad harvest and to decline in food availability. To let the private market allocate the scarce food resources through free trade, remains therefore the core of the British famine policy. State infrastructure is only on the side to help stabilize or to optimize market allocation. For Malthusians, even famine restores market equilibrium by limiting overcrowding and the correlated demographic stress on natural resources. But the colonial administration is not also monolithic and ways of conceptualizing scarcity are actually debated, have impact also on the definition of famine policy. Scarcity is a fact with devastating impact on the colonial population, but it is also an administrative construct. Moreover, we can show that colonial, uh, the colonial official mind evolves during the period. According to Ambirayan in his book, the devastating Oris of famine of 1866 marks a shift in the official mind. The catastrophe aggravated by the non-intervention non of the colonial states, delaying grain imports, pu pushes towards the necessity of famine prevention, mainly through public works. After the 1880s, the colonial states pushes towards gathering more information on famine and on scarcity, and reasserting its legitimacy through uh, famine prevention. It is also increasingly exposed to the politicization of famine with the emergence of the Indian National Congress uh, after 1885 and the formalization of nationalist economics by, for example, Naoroji, which you already mentioned. The official conceptualization, therefore, of scarcity evolves from a focalization on grain towards a focalization on labor. As summarized by Colonel Bert Smith in his report, uh, in, uh, on the 1861 famine in the Northwest provinces, these famines are rather famines of work than of food. And famine is seen, increasingly seen, therefore, as a problem of employment, uh, legitimizing the colonial program of development and of infrastructure. But how do these colonial actors make sense, actually, of scarcity? The first step is to identify it, its causes, its chronology, its seriousness, its impact. And to make sense of it, they try to use indicators of scarcity, both statistical and empirical. Empirically, there is first this idea that scarcity is a matter of public discourse, expression of a fear of want among the local population. Colonial actors, for example, Express this when auditioned by the Famine Commission of 1867. The prevailing scarcity and difficulty in procuring grain were constant topics of discussion, but at that time, I believe it was not understood that we were on the verge of famine. Scarcity is thus considered as the first step before famine and is often, as such, undercut by colonial officials. The public discourse on scarcity is usually perceived as, as a way also of negotiating with local elites and with the state. The actual transition from scarcity to famine is usually framed as a problem of information. 
Starting in 1885, famine codes are produced by the colonial state in order to anticipate famine and to set uniform rules also of administration when it actually occurs. These codes are periodically amended and the period of scarcity is seen as the key moment of famine prevention. It lies actually between the period of observation and tests and that of severe distress or famine. Interestingly, the actual word scarcity, more specific, replaces distress in the Berger Famine Code of, the, of 1913 to describe the in-between moments where people start to feel the effects of dearth, but without mortality. For the indicators, price levels are considered the main indicators of scarcity and of the dysfunction of the allocation process. If a good is scarce, its price will rise. But the focalization on price level is also criticized by local actors. Prices can be purely nominal when food is not available. They are also highly segmented. Famine price in one locality being no indicator of scarcity in another. For example, colonial officials in Calcutta fail to anticipate famine because they usually make sense of price levels in rural areas with reference to price levels in the capital city. And prices in the rural areas are much lower usually than in the imperial metropolis, which makes also rural consumers very much more vulnerable to any price rise. Moreover, even more so in a colonial context, Collecting prices is not only an economical, but also a sociological process. As underlined by an Indian merchant, European officials are recording prices as they are declared by local merchants or as reported to them by their Indian servants. They often don't have direct access to the information on prices at the market, but they rely mostly on intermediaries. Prices recorded on paper are therefore prices accessible to Europeans, to urban residents and not to rural consumers. Uh, these gaps in information also impact the ability to anticipate famine. Mortality by starvation is also an indicator of the seriousness of scarcity and a corrective sometimes to price levels, which can be really criticized. Some officials decide, for example, to include mentions of cases of starvation in their periodical report on prices in order to get better indication of the actual impact of scarcity and its shift towards famine. Scarcity has to be identified first, but it has also then to be explained. And there are debates on the nature, the actual nature of scarcity and what the, resor what the resources are considered scarce. Is it grain? Is it money? According to the government of uh, Bengal, uh, sorry, not this one, this one. Uh, high levels of price reveal actually lack of money to buy food more than the decline in food availability. So for example, in this narrative on the distress and scarcity in the lower provinces, uh, the lieutenant governor received an appeal for assistance from the government on behalf of the native Christian population of Nudea who are stated to be in common with their neighbors suffering distress from scarcity and dearness of rice. The commissioner was called on for a report as to the state of the district. He, after full investigation, replied that there was considerable distress in the center of the district where the Christian villages were situated, for that though there was grain in store, money was scarce among the poor. And he explains it by the fact that the Mahajans, so the local bankers, are unwilling to advance upon the future crop. The commissioner therefore recommended that relief should be given by supplying employment and 20,000 rupees were accordingly placed at the commissioner's disposal by the public works department for this particular purpose. This testimony points to the key issue of publicly interpreting the nature of scarcity and the cause of dearness of price. The definition of famine policies will depend on the interpretation of scarcity. And scarcity is here a matter of deficit in rural monetization, aggravated by the economic anticipation of local actors, and especially the local bankers, because of uncertainty of the next harvest, have triggered a credit crisis uh, amongst the lower classes. This is the same idea that the, often the idea of speculation by local bankers and landholders of storing grain to make price rise and to make profits at the expense of the poor. 
Grain is therefore seen as available, but money is not. And the question is not here to entitle people to food. Rather, the belief in the existence of local stocks of grain delays public response to scarcity first. And then this interpretation of a money famine gives also legitimacy to the politics of relief work. It also avoids the question of embargo on rice exports, which is a classical claim of the moral economy of the poor, but which would disturb precisely the imperial allocation process. So instead of directly supplying the starving with food, colonial official condition relief to employment, relief is, give, is given in money, not in kind, and first in order to restrict and discipline relief allocation. Constant fear expressed of demoralization, pauperization, largely inherited from the British New Poor Law of 1834, and also radicalized by the colonial context. So first, the idea to restrict and discipline relief. Relief itself has to be scarce, to be properly economical, and to keep the incentive to work. Moreover, relief works are seen as an efficient mode of indirect intervention on the part of the colonial state. The private market is not disturbed by the focalization on money relief, and grain imports are actually limited. Finally, the value of silver being increasingly depreciated in the second half of the 19th century, grain prices tend to rise more than money prices. Uh, so to provide relief in money rather than in grain is also a matter of financial stringency for the colonial state. It is only when, and actually rarely, grain imports leave surplus that relief in kind is encouraged to avoid waste. So as we've seen, the conceptualization of scarcity contributes to shape the definition of famine policies and reveal also state priorities, securing free trade in grain, mobilizing labor. But the relief allocation process also makes colonial actors mobilize the concept of scarcity to voice their contrasting interests in times of famine. Firstly, relief works are periodically accused by local entrepreneurs and landholders of producing shortages in manpower. So famine wages on relief works must stay less eligible than market wages in order not to compete with the private sector. And landholders are also keen to have agricultural workers resume as quick as possible uh, agricultural labor. But reference to scarcity can also become a way of criticizing the way relief is granted. Scarcity of laborers on relief works reveal the deficiencies in the public grain imports. The contradiction, sorry, I don't see. Yeah. Okay, so no, quickly, no. it's just two minutes? No, no, five, five, five. Oh, okay, so but I've practically finished. But reference to scarcity can also become a way of criticizing the way relief is granted. Scarcity of laborers reveals the deficiency in public grain imports, the contradiction also of colonial famine policies, which are torn between dedication to free trade and limited intervention through forms of developmentalism. Colonial engineers, for example, express this contradiction. Scarcity and risk of famine gives them space to advocate massive development programs, development with, a, with no, not really development, uh, well, like irrigation or transport, but they did for that to secure manpower on the relief works and the rigid principle of relief allocation produced scarcity of labor. So as expressed by the engineer of the East India Irrigation Company in Kutak in Arissa, exclusive relief payments in money is no incentive for him to have laborers come to the relief works. The supply of work, of labor, he says, was greatly affected by the scarcity of rice. We were only able to keep together skilled laborers by paying them partly in money and partly in rice. I attribute the diminution of the numbers of laborers from January, uh, from January to February and from February to March entirely to mortality and to the difficulty in procuring food. I consider that this system of part payment in rice should have been applied also to the government works. And I think that the efficiency of the works undertaken and the relief of the distress was greatly diminished by the neglect to adopt this system. This argument of scarcity can also be therefore an instrument of justification after the famine, when the relief operations are over, but are increasingly under scrutiny because of some terrifying mortality rates. 
To justify, for example, the delays in organizing relief works and in securing grain imports, colonial officials often refer to the scarcity of European staff. The Cuttack magistrate, for example, states that there was a deficiency of officers under the magistrate and that in consequence, the relief, um, the supervision of relief operations was not so sufficient as it might have been and especially towards the coast. I had also not a sufficiency of clerical assistance, therefore I postponed ordinary works for relief operation as far as I possibly could. So to conclude briefly, the cheap government of scarcity can therefore be criticized also from within the frame of colonial development, but scarcity will become increasingly obviously politicized outside the colonial field when Indian nationalist economists make of the Raj a truly famine state. Thank you. Looking forward to your remarks or questions. Yeah, well done. Thank you, Elena. Uh, do you have a question, Adira? Um, yes, but why don't you, you begin, first? Maria? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I should so, begin. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, okay, I wanted to. Um, I, I, I can, but my initial question, I might have more in depending on what Nadir's questions is and when I've had a bit more time to think, but the, you know, these debates around scarcity are, um, are huge at the time and, and, and continue to be very big in Indian history, right? Because famines um, actually intensify during the colonial era um and 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 you know the the worst i have is in the 1940s so after the dates that you're looking at um and then you have emeritus sen's very famous famine theory around around the fact that the, it's not about scarcity of food it's rather the poverty right inequality right the, the access as you put to money which i thought was interesting this i, th I thought you, you kind of you put words on simple words on, on a quite a complex theory by saying, you know, what is scarce? Is it the grain or is it the money, right? I thought that was quite a good way to put it because then it's just so clear as to what we're talking about. And I, I, I guess my question was like, how does this, um, the discussion of the scarce relief fit into this bigger debate around famines are not caused by, you know, inefficient agriculture, it's rather that it's caused by droughts that happen from time to time. We can't do anything about that. And then prices shoot up. Yeah. So how, how does that relate to this scarce relief, relief idea? And, and the idea that they didn't really want to intervene very much in India. Uh, should I answer now or I take over? As you wish. It depends if it's related or... Well, yeah, maybe that, that might make it easier for the discussion. Can you hear me, Maria? That's okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I found this um, extremely intriguing and especially, uh, as Maria said, the way you uh, really dealt with that issue of what is scarcity mm -hmm. and putting the words it, it, in very clear words, it, is it scarcity in green or in money? And I completely agree with Maria too, because that is the debate that we've brought forward since then and which Amartya Sen has taken up. Um, and I found just, it's more of a comment that I'd like to make is I, I found it really ironic that the, um, uh, the British administrators had this idea that it's price levels that would be the indicator of a famine. Therefore this belief that the markets would adjust and show us if there was a problem, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the discourse after a crisis, after a famine, with the, the distribution of relief to say that, well, the relief needs to be scarce and it should not disturb the market. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, it, it's just so contradictory. Yeah, it's like a circular reasoning or so. Exactly. Like, yeah. and, and the fact that, you know, that they could make this public discourse on scarcity and, and 
blame it on the market, but then say, no, the markets should not be, uh, mm. they, we should not disturb the markets. Mm. So, you know, I, I just find it, um, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating and it, it, you know, it, it just shows how important the, the, um, the subject of what is scarcity and how has it played into the policies is, is, is very interesting. So that's, it's more my comment that I'd like to make on that. Okay, so the, both uh, comments and questions are related, so yes. I will answer it now. So thank you very much. But uh, I think to come back to the question first of uh, Maria, the link between uh, uh, what is scarce and or natural scarcity and then uh, uh, scarcity of relief. What I wanted to show actually was exactly what you said is that the politics of scarcity. So, so how they, they navigate con perpetual contradiction, the idea that it's not there is not one idea of what is scarcity, but there is really also tension within the colonial field, and there is also many contradictions, and uh, which I find also very interesting. The way also scarcity is more afterwards a problem of um, a relief politics than actual uh, the actual grain or money, or, and then the poor are, are never there actually. So that's also really interesting. The way also with words. Uh, the poor are totally, are totally erased from uh, uh, the argument, but um, uh, it goes maybe a bit with uh, also the discussion around uh, uh, Amartya Sen uh, theory, so the question of entitlement, now it was also uh, afterward discussed by Amrita Rangasani, for example, so the, this idea that uh, uh, even in the colonial uh, uh, in the colonial field, there was this kind of idea of entitlement, but with totally different, uh, obviously, uh, political consequences. But there was also this, this politics of scarcity, which is here and which is uh, really uh, interesting to, to, um, to uh, unwrap or I don't know how, how we would say that, but yeah. So that, that what I find fascinating is that this idea that they can have several arguments at the same time and then switching from one to the other according to their actual interests uh, at, uh, at, 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 this, at, one, at one point in time. So yeah. Um, and actually the, the, the problem of scarcity in nature, uh, uh, it's one explanation, but they also have this explanation of price or market, as you said, uh, market failure and then work. So I, I think that actually the nature of scarcity doesn't come first. But then you have this politics, and then we find an explanation of scarcity to make sense mm -hmm. of what we actually did. So it's more in this sense, actually, than, uh, than the reverse. So, yeah. Uh, and so wait, that goes also to your point on the contradiction yes. uh, between uh, what is scarce and then uh, what, is, uh, what is put in place. Yeah. But it's still a, a, a huge debate. Uh, uh, on uh, even today, on uh, we, we we go back to to your point on poverty. How do how do we identify poverty, the poverty line, and stuff like that? And here it's more. Yeah, we see that it's really also the cheap government. That, what I, I found also interesting is the both the, the this contradiction that we cheap government on one side, and then we we also try to intervene a bit, but not too much uh, because there is this question of a bit legitimacy, but at the same time, yeah, market. Um, market allocation to secure, so yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, there's lots of debates around this um, today. And, and this idea that they, they, they produce narratives after the fact, I mean, that's quite something that historians have, have found over and over again um, in India, you know, the fact that they said that they were, they had civil, civilizing mission in India, that was actually something that came after. They were first initially there because they needed an excuse around why they were there, even to their own population in Britain. Right. Uh, I just I wanted to just say two things. Um, first, I I forgot to mention the, and I guess I just didn't see, but maybe I mean I haven't read your paper, but did you look at Ramachandra Dutt and his um, study uh, on I've poverty? I've looked in more at Nauruji, but less on Dot, yeah, so if you have insights. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, uh, maybe if you stop the screen share for the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll wait till you share. See what happened to the reality. Oops, is it us? I must have a gauche. If we have a gauche. A gauche, okay. <laughs> ah. Is it better? 
Oh, yeah, I we're think back. So. We're, I'm we're back. back. I'm sorry. This is this is super frustrating. <laughs> this has not happened to me here before. Um, yeah, the Ramesh Dutch, you know, he actually collects data in the rural areas, and he's the one who starts really agriculture economics in India um, by doing this, which was quite odd at the time to to travel to rural areas to actually collect data. Um, so, and he comes up with this, I think he's a predecessor basically to Amrita Sen's theory of the fact that famines are produced by high prices and not um, food scarcity. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through this because we do need to move on to Nadira's um, presentation. The I, really interesting point about the poor being missing, right? We, we, can't, we talk about the poor, I mean, it's connected to Dutt's research, right? The fact mm -hmm. that he yeah. is the first to say oh let's actually go talk to these people and gather data from them because they actually know quite a lot about what they do and you know <laughs> and and this is fascinating because if you look at the history of poverty like the definition of poverty in the later part of the 20th century which i worked on a bit with mary morgan um i forget which it's the second paper we published in hope about you know how development the definition of development became actually more a definition of poverty because they said we need to count and define people who don't have development i.e poor people right so it's the opposite right you either have development or you're poor and then the, the what, what started to happen was that you had this movement in the 1990s you know the the backlash of imf loans and so on and people saying look we actually need to understand what poverty is we need to understand these people and so we need to go to these these areas and actually talk to these people and so then the world bank kind of um uh thought okay we're getting you know attacked here we need to do something about this and their report i think in 2000 or maybe it was 1990 i forget exactly actually had uh quotes from poor people in their report or people close to poverty so um uh like like yeah. scarce like famine relief support workers which you mentioned there but so this is much later on in history but um you know people working for charities in places like um like on the african continent or you know uh, poverty stricken areas basically and so that was really just it was a response to the um you know quite intense critique that the World Bank and the IMF were getting at this time saying, you know, your loans are, you know, leaving it to the market is not a good idea. Um, and you're not even, because you don't even understand what poverty is. And they said, okay, we need to go to the source. But what I found fascinating about these accounts was that literally they put them on the margins of their report. So they weren't even <laughs> integrating really into the text, right? And you can kind of reading the report, you get that sense that, okay, so we added those for, you know, icing on the top. But we weren't really listening to them, right? We were listening to what we think poverty is and what we thought it has been for, you know, decades. Um, I, I mean, I think this is, you know, far beyond your time period. So I don't want to add something extra to your research, but it's interesting that yeah, this sure, is an sure, ongoing sure. discussion, yeah, yeah. I, ongoing absolutely. discussion in poverty debates yeah. around, you know, who can define it and who do we talk yeah. to define it and so on. And who has that kind of the voice to be part of those debates. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Eleanor. It was really fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, we're going to need to move on to the yeah. <laughs> Can I just a question before we start? So we have run over a little bit. Um, I don't know what will happen here at half past, but if you, yeah. the two of you are happy to stay, do you want to stay for? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I can. And we have, yeah. I mean, the, the room's booked. So if, if, uh, if Asher is, I mean, if HS is going to allow us to, you know, just extend for a few minutes, yep, all the better. Yeah, exactly, because I want to give you 20 minutes presentation, you know. Actually, I aimed for 15, so I'm, I'm oh, okay perfect. in terms of present, because, yeah, it might be more interesting to actually discuss. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see. Okay. I'll try to be. So, yeah, so do, let's do 15 minutes then, and then hopefully yeah. we'll have time for discussion. Hopefully they won't shut us down to have a little bit of discussion after that. Yes, okay? I hope. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So, yes, Let thank me. you so much, Nadira, for offering to present, and I'm very excited to hear your presentation.
Okay, thank you. Um, all right, thanks a lot. And so we're going to move uh, from to we're, we're going to move towards a little more recent history, economic history from South Asia, um, and uh, but a lot of discussion also about the policies and how it has been conceptualized. And um, and I have many sources including Indian economists and South Asian writers, but also a more Western uh, approach. So this is how my work fits into uh, this panel today on Indian perspectives. And I am going to discuss how migrant labor is represented in economics, looking at theory and policy. Um, and then I am going to present a particular problem um, related to labor migration. And then what I intend to do is take you through what I believe are the conceptual limits uh, that have facilitated this problematic situation. And then I will explain why I believe economics has had a role to play in maintaining these limits and structures. And then I'll end on a hopeful note with uh, ways of uh, what I think are ways of uh, reducing these limits. So the problem or the case that I am discussing is the case of temporary women migrant workers going from South Asia to the Middle East to work as maids, as domestic helpers. And this is a significant trend um, in South Asia with low-skilled women from India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, the Philippines and Nepal traveling to work on temporary labor contracts of two years or so generally to work as maids in their employers' homes in the Middle East. So South Asia is known as a migrant sending region and the success of this trend is measured by the remittances flowing back to the region. India receives the highest amount of remittances in the world, as you can see on this slide. And um, we see also that Philippines, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are have places among the top 10 receiving countries. Now the host countries are the Middle East or the Gulf region. And this is since the 1970s and the oil boom, when there was a surge in disposable income and this led to an increase in the demand for domestic workers. The employers from the Middle East typically engage their maids or domestic workers through employment agencies uh, for temporary contracts, as I said, two to three years, often renewable. The conditions of work, salaries, leave, holidays, and so on are generally discussed with the agencies and they are presented to the maids as non-negotiable. For sending countries, remittances are a major source of foreign revenue. Temporary labor migration is seen also as a way of reducing poverty that we've been discussing and also as a driver of development. For the receiving countries, cheap labor fulfills their demand for domestic helpers. Now, these trends are controlled by international global labor markets with little regulation. They are, it's, it's a free market system that reigns with very little regulation, as I said, and the sending countries compete with each other with seemingly unlimited supply of labor, while receiving countries have the upper hand with regard to the terms of employment and working conditions. Now, the problem here that I wish to discuss today is uh, the fact that since women have been migrating on temporary contracts from South Asia to fulfill low-skilled temporary labor needs in the Middle East, their experiences have been reported back by newspapers, NGOs, and other activists as horrendous tales of abuse, torture, and murder. Um, the slide that you have here, which is from a Re uh, Reuters news article of 2016, I've highlighted some key words and they just say it all. Um, it almost appears as if these incidents were not and except they were not exceptions. They seem to be the norm characterizing the very harsh working conditions that most migrant women faced. I've pinpointed 2007 
as a, as a turning point, especially for Sri Lanka, because it, it, it was the moment of an incident that appeared to be the climax of this situation, um, where an underage migrant was accused uh, of murdering an infant in her care, and she was sentenced to death. And despite appeals by the government for clemency, uh, and, and despite the fact that it was um, that her passport had been doctored, so she was underage when she migrated, despite all these factors being presented, um, she was beheaded in 2013. So since her imprisonment and sentencing, many protests were held for her release, but also these protests shed light on the harsh conditions that most temporary labor migrants faced. So the need for greater protection became obvious and governments uh, from South Asia have sought to solve this problem, mainly through restrictive measures. For example, Indonesia in 2016 announced a permanent ban on sending women to the Middle East. The ban was revoked in 2017. Sri Lanka also has been toying with the idea of a ban for a long time. However, the problem here is that the impact of bans has mostly been to make the problem go underground, like the government of Indonesia realized after the numbers of illegal departures and numbers of human trafficking increased, banning migrants from leaving forces them to do so illegally. In other words, it does not address the crux of the matter, it just avoids the problem. However, while governments may attempt to circumvent the matter by preventing women from leaving, the forces that make them leave in the first place remain. The causes are still there. So instead of being able to do so legally with the regulation and supervision that legal migration provides, they face increasing risks. So this brings me to the conceptual limits, which I believe prevent effective solutions. Vulnerability is uh, one in its plural forms appears to characterize this type of labor migration. The free market ideology underpins global low-skilled labor markets. Just like discussing goods and services, the labor market here describes is also described in terms of supply and demand, in other words, as governed by market forces. So by extension, the service provided on labor markets is reduced to skills, is reduced to what the women can provide without taking into consideration the person producing the service. Now, this has been called commodification and the dangers of commodification have been increasingly highlighted in economic analyses. Nevertheless, as long as markets are understood and accepted to be best provided or best left to self-adjust, and that they adjust to provide the most optimal outcomes, concrete action to address the vulnerabilities faced by migrants is, not weak, is very weak. And in the case of South Asian countries, despite the large number of migrants and the number of people concerned, their families, the severe competition on global labor markets weakens their bargaining power. So the sending nations are unable to negotiate for better working conditions for their migrants. And even worse, they are unwilling to compromise their competitive positions by making demands on protection, rights, and the well-being of migrants. Now, um, institutions such as the ILO, the UN, the IOM, and the UN have been making active recommendations advocating conventions and laws, but the markets appear more powerful. To give you an example, in 96, Sri Lanka ratified the International Convention on the Protection of Migrant Workers and their families, and many sending countries have ratified such conventions. However, the receiving countries have not. So the UN Committee on Migrant Workers made a comment on the fact that many countries employing South Asian migrant workers are not yet parties to the international conventions and that these are an obstacle to the enjoyment by those workers of their rights. However, Sri Lanka, like other 
South Asian nations, cannot afford to insist on host countries ratifying these conventions. Not only do they fear losing their export markets, but like with the example of bans, backfiring, and creating even greater risks, migrants are willingly going to work under these conditions. Now here, I'm not going into the discussion of uh, the what I meant by willingly, because there is a huge discussion here too about uh, whether this is free will or how much constraints are actually playing into their decisions. Instead, I will move to my next question, which is where do these conceptual structures come from? In other words, um, how has economics facilitated the, the, the ability to maintain such conditions where vulnerabilities are actually increasing today. Um, in sum, I would say it is the prevailing neoliberal framework uh, and the focus on the economic, uh, economic concerns relating to migration. So by compiling a corpus of interdisciplinary literature dealing with temporary labor migration, I have noted the following uh, characteristics. Um, most of the economic literature, and this by literature, I mean um, the writing on temporary labor migration done by academics, but also NGOs, international institutions, and states, which can be identified also in economic journals and reviews, much of this literature discusses migration by analyzing its causes, determinants and drivers, and by looking at the relation between migration and other economic concerns, such as development, human capital, employment, labor markets, and so on. Um, if we look at the main phases of the economic literature dealing with migration, we can see um, at the beginning, with starting with Ravenstein and Arthur Lewis, the disparities of labor, have been attributed as the causes, disparities in skills, geographical disparities, um, seen as explanations for internal displacement first, and this model was extended on an international level. And then we had push-pull factors and models uh, using cost-benefit analyses to explain migration. Then since the 1970s, we have what is called the new economics of labor migration, where we have decision making explained not only on individual levels, but at household levels, seen as collective decisions. But all this literature so far uh, focused mostly on migration with a focus on development, which is called the migration development nexus. In other words, it's the instrumental value of migration that was put forward to see how it helps development. More recently, we have integrative approaches with interdisciplinary uh, perspectives. And here, economics is borrowed from sociology, uh, anthropology, and gender studies. And this has brought the complexity of migration to the fore and had added a wealth of insights into what migration, the migration experience, what it really is. And this is also where Amartya Sen enters the picture. His capability approach has been uh, integrated into migration studies. And much like his work, in uh, development, it has focused on people. It has enabled migration to focus on people. And um, I'm just, so this is Sen's framework in general on economics, but I'm going to go back, go on to the next slide, which is how Sen's work has been used in migration. And uh, it has increased the informational base. Thanks to Sen's idea of uh, including intangible accounts into decision making, we see um, that this has brought in factors such as self esteem and the social perception, which plays a lot into the entire migration experience. Similarly, uh, a lot of the literature used by the UN and the ILO and other institutions have also um, quoted Sen in putting migration forward as a right and migration seen as a right. And then also for the gender aspect, we have Sen's work, which has been extremely um, instrumental. And um, so what I would like to say here is that my discussion um, has been embedded in the context of South Asian women, domestic migrant workers. Um, and 
At the same time, I have looked at how the conceptual constructs have influenced the thinking and as a result has actually influenced the policies and the, the, the way the market um, has been maybe allowed to function so far. Um, but thanks to the ideas endorsed by Sen and others, I believe that um, we have managed to put the focus back on people. And as this quote by anthropologist Michel Gambard, who says that money makes the world go round and makes women go around the world, I believe that by focusing on the people and by uh, broadening the concerns to go beyond narrow economic concerns of remittances, economic gains and losses, I believe that we can envisage more effective means of protection and empowerment and reduce the vulnerabilities on the markets. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nadira. That's excellent. It's nice to have some different time periods, um, even though, the, yeah. It, it obviously was a, a topic quite different um, from, from mine and Eleanor's um, presentation. I'm, I'm seeing that nothing is happening here, even though the session is over. So let's, let's have 10 minutes of discussion if, if, you're, yep. if you're still um, awake great. enough. <laughs> for, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if your attention spam is, is still there. So I wanted to... Um, Yes, Eleanor, do you have a question straight away? I'll, I can let you go first. If you yes, like. yes. Uh, go well, I thought it was really, really fascinating and constitute the, the focus back on, the, on people in the migration and especially on women. Uh, I had just uh, maybe not a question directly, but I was struck by what, was what you said on uh, migration as a right. And uh, I was just uh, wondering how to enforce uh, mm. that right, because you spoke of the, the number of abuses and everything. So uh, on these women who are, who are women, who are South Asian, who are laborers. And so my question would be um, how to enforce uh, these rights of migrants and how on, on, on which kind of um, uh, a flow to play because, uh, for example, is it sexism? Is it xenophobia? Is it uh, uh, labor law? I don't know mm. how to, to play on, do activists. I don't know people working on this on, on the enforcement of um, migration as a right or people who are reflecting on this. I don't have a clue on, uh, on, on which tool to play uh, with this. Uh, yeah. That would be my question. Shall I answer the question, Maria? Uh, yeah, but I think it's, if you don't mind, I can just ask or yes. ask my question because it's, I think it's di directly related to what Eleanor right. is. Guess, we, we had similar, the, the similar, the same thing kind of um, mm -hmm. jumped out at us. I, also, this idea of immigration as a right and and at the end, you saying that 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 was thanks to or partly thanks to Amrita Sen's idea of bringing um, yep. immigration to this people level, understanding you know why are they immigrating, um, and and yeah, giving kind of a voice to the actual people themselves, right? Um, mm. But how is that? You said that it then that affects policy that that's had a you know this positive effect I guess because you yes. said it positively positive effect on policy and I just wonder really is that is that right because I'm thinking about you know the the tendencies in Europe now to vote right wing which is directly connected to our um, problems with integration of our of our immigrants since the 2015 um, immigration crisis um, and sure economics has started to publish more and more positively about the wealth benefits of uh, welcoming immigrants but I mean has that yeah. seeped into our mm. into our reality into our society into our you know societal discourse and has it also then seeped into the way we vote I mean I yeah yeah I think that there's that's um you're both focusing on an aspect which I think is is 
it's not um, surprising because this is one of the crucial points about if when we're discussing migration and immigration, the whole aspect about the laws and what is allowed. And I like the way you said, is it positive? <laughs> is it okay to say it's positive or not? Because that, that is the main question. Maybe, I think how I would like to um, answer this question, migration as a right, uh, and as Eleanor asked, and then, you know, is this, how does this reflect also in the policies today and also in Europe? Um, I think the first thing that um, ha I would like to say here is uh, a lot of the literature um, when migration was seen as not having direct links in the, on, to development, Right. A lot of the literature, and this was termed the pessimistic twist in the literature on migration. And, and because actually it was seen that migration people with skills, especially leaving the country, was referred to as brain drain. And hence, it actually had a negative impact on the origin, countries of origin. People were leaving, uh, families were broken up. It, you know, the, the, so for a number of reasons, the analyses, the literature pointed to, well, no, there's actually no link between or there's either no link with migration and development or there's no positive link. And hence, um, this influenced a lot of the policies, the sending countries as a result, well, they were reluctant to promote the export of labor. Um, it became, well, a struggle. However, this is where I think the policies are strongly influenced by the literature, because the phenomenon did not stop. People kept migrating anyway. People were leaving. Whether there was an impact on development or not, it did not stop the flows. However, it just made it harder for people to leave, because then restrictive policies were put in place in host countries and in, and in sending countries. So it just made it harder. And this I think this situation propelled a lot of the institutions, um, the ILO and the I, um, UN, to realize that people were leaving. It was still, it, it, instead of making it easier, it just made it harder for them to leave. And this led to uh, all the channels of, well, the, the illegal and um, dangerous channels of migrating. And as a result, I think the whole discourse about migration as a right became very important. And that, that's where uh, there was a lot of vocal uh, discussion saying, well, it's actually a right. People need to be able to leave. And just, I think another way of maybe answering that question would be to explain the difficulties in categorizing migration. Um, I used, I mean, I said that I'm talking about temporary labor migration here, but in the case of immigration, when countries are trying to de decide who is coming in and why, I think it's very hard to say this is because of economic factors, this is because of political or security factors, or this is for humanitarian reasons, right? So, I mean, the, the boundaries are blurred and um, the categories are useful for analysts when they are trying to, well, put the people into, you know, the boxes and say, well, these are economic reasons, this is what needs to be done and so on. But I think in reality, the categories are extremely difficult to differentiate. And um, so it's not easy to say what reasons exactly are pushing people to, to leave. Um, and so I think uh, the, the, because of that, the laws became important to say, well, the freedom to leave, to migrate for whatever reason uh, needs to be ensured. Now, the question of how is it actually enforced is, is very difficult to answer because that um, there is not much of a global, well, there, 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 there are attempts to make this a global discussion, but it is very much, and I think here I would, um, I would be answering your question, Maria, is that it, it, it's very much decided by the receiving countries, correct? And this is where I think the um, discourse and the policies uh, are, become important because um, how what I'd like to say here maybe is that I've noticed in Europe that 
we quote, well, the whole case of Brexit, if you take Brexit, for example, economic factors were given to explain the cost of border control, the cost of um, immigration, right? So it was explained in economic terms. I'm wondering whether we've lost her again. <laughs> um, I, I, it's us. Hear. Is it us? Whoops. No, we're we still here. I can hear you, but your your video has paused. Oh, it's frozen. Well, yeah, there we go. That's it's funny back. because. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me just see if I can. Uh, we are still connected. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I can. I think we're back now. Uh, we are. Okay, but uh, we have a warning message from. <laughs> HES. Yeah. We're yeah. Well, we're just about to finish. Yeah. To wrap up. Yeah, um, yeah. It's really interesting. I think. I think what you're. I think what you're trying to say is migration as a right, rather than immigration as a right. Exactly. Because it, because you're focusing. Yeah, you're focusing on the countries seeing people leave, rather than the people that are receiving the people. Because yep. that, and I guess that was my question. Where, you know, has this actually changed? You know, the UAE's. Um, handling of immigrants maybe not so yeah. much yeah no but but um, my main argument that I think what we say and the way we use economic arguments to discuss both migration and immigration this has an influence on uh, the public thinking correct and mm -hmm. and hence people have this idea that well immigration is a problem because it's a cost and we hear these words very much. It's a cost. It's a huge cost. It, it's a cost to the host country. And so I think this is where, um, well, the economic literature has, has a role to play Some uh, along the lines of what you were saying about conceptualizing. The conceptualizing has an in influence on the policies, correct? The way, in, what we say, the nature and of scarcity. So, 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 so,